Is before I commence our program today, I would like to thank the brothers and sisters of the Committee of the Islamic Center for inviting me today to participate in the event. We have, as you know, the sleepover. And my humble contribution to our events today is indeed a lecture and discussion about Christmas and Islamic perspective. Before I do that, however, I would like to make a, a few points. It'd be nice if we could come a bit forward, if we come forward, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, which he encouraged his Sahaba to do. But before I do that, it gathered upon me today that there are a few things that we need to understand about festivals and celebrations. In Islam, in the Arabic language, the term used for a festival or celebration is Eid. And Eid, it comes from the Arabic word Aada, you read. Aad means to return or to come back. So Muhammad, Aada Muhammad means Muhammad, he came back after leaving. In terms of Islamic terminology, the word Eid means something that returns, either at a particular time or in a particular place. So for example, Valentine's Day is an Eid, why? It comes back at a particular time in the year. Christmas is considered to be an Eid, why? Because it comes at a particular time in the year. Would it be possible to say, okay, we'll have Christmas this year on the 26th rather than the 25th? Nobody would accept that. It is intended by Christmas that it is on a particular day. So that's the first point we need to understand. What cons constitutes a celebration in Islam? The second and a very important point, brothers and sisters, is that... In Islam, we have only two Eids, strictly speaking. That is Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. As our Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came to Medina and he found the people celebrating a particular day, he said that he would give, show them something better than this. And it was Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. So these are the only two days of Eid we have in Islam, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. So with this being said, brothers and sisters, it is not permissible for somebody to celebrate any other day of celebration than Eid al-Adha, which comes after the Hajj, at the end of the Hajj, sorry, and Eid al-Fitr, which comes at the end of Ramadan. It's not permissible for somebody to celebrate any other festival. Similarly, it's not permissible for somebody to participate in an Eid other than Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. Especially as these other Eids, most of these celebrations are based on paganism. Whether it be Valentine's Day, Christmas Day, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, most of these days that we celebrate, especially in the West, are pagan celebrations that were co-opted, that is, taken under their wing by the Christian church. You could trace them back to the Celts, as, in, the, as in, in respect to Halloween, or you could trace it back to the ancient Romans, as you could trace it back, the Christmas celebration, trace it back to them. So the Muslim is not permissible to celebrate these celebrations, nor to do the things that you normally do in these celebrations. For example, to give people greetings, it is the consensus of the Muslims, the consensus of the four Madhahib, the four schools of thought and other than them. That's impermissible to give people greetings on the days of these Eids. Also, in terms of gift giving, it's not permissible for somebody to give gifts. Especially on these Eids. These Eids, these celebrations are based upon paganism. How can one participate? Allah says, ala barri wa taqwa, to cooperate upon righteousness and piety. 
Don't cooperate upon enmity and hatred, enmity and sin. And if this is a pagan celebration, how can it be considered to cooperating upon righteousness and piety? Rather, it is cooperating upon enmity and sin. With that being said, brothers and sisters, leads us to our discussion on Christmas, the origin of Christmas. First of all, I have a question to ask. Christmas is what? What is Christmas? Hmm. Pagan festival. Besides that, what is the official, the official purpose of Christmas? Excellent. Well done. The official description of 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 Christmas is to celebrate the birthday of of Jesus, alayhi salatu salam. Doesn't that seem very similar to us? Does it seem very similar? Just recently we, we celebrated Staffalawa to be like. Some Muslims celebrated, should I say, yes? We didn't celebrate. The birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, isn't it? Very similar. And of course, as we know, the Muslims took that from this. Celebrate the Prophet's birthday. They took that from the, the Christians celebrating the birthday of Jesus. Now here comes a big, big question. If Christmas is to celebrate the birthday of Jesus, when was Jesus born? Anybody? The brother is very, very right. Concerning the date of birth of Isa alayhi salatu salam, there is a consensus. We all agree we don't know. We all agree we don't know. Around 200 Christian era, Clement of Alexandria wrote, there are those who have determined not only the year of our Lord's birth, here he means Jesus, but also the day. And they say it took place in the 28th year of Augustus. In the 20th day of the Egyptian month of May. Further others say he was born on the 24th or the 25th of April. This is from one of the church elders. Writing 200 Christian era. Meaning what? And that's another thing I want to say. Nothing of what I mentioned today comes from Muslim sources. Nothing. It's all from Christian sources and atheist sources. That 200 Christian era, there was no consensus as to when Jesus was born. Some say it was August, some say it was April, some say it was May. Nobody said it was in December and nobody claimed they had an absolute knowledge of when Jesus was born. However, the word Christmas coming from Christ Mass, the Mass of Christ, was first founded in 1038. 1038. Is that a long time ago or a short period? Huh? Um, okay, it's around a thousand years. But if they claim Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, is that a long time then? It's well after, a thousand years after he was born. Isn't it, yeah? If we look at it that way, Jesus was born for a thousand years, died a thousand years, as they say he died, yes? We don't believe he died. Then in 1038, we find the first use of the word Christ Mass, the Mass of Jesus. And so, we find, brothers and sisters, that there is an origin to Christmas, a history to Christmas which we're not told about. Because when you go to school, they tell you Christmas is about Jesus being born, and then we do the nativity, am I right, the play. So you have Mary is Fatima, Jesus is Ahmed, and the three wise men are Luqman, Dawood, and Anwar. Am I right? And 
we follow the story taken from the Bible where Jesus was born in a barn, a manger. And when he was born, the star came out that guided the three wise men to where the manger was. Am I right? To the end of the story. This is what we are told. But actually, brothers and sisters, there is a secret origin. Now, the early Christian writers, people like Oregon of Alexandria, who, who was writing around 165 to 264 Christian era, they used to mock the Roman celebrations of birthdays. They used to, these early church writers, would consider them to be pagan. The birthday which many people celebrate is of pagan origins, brothers and sisters. The people who practiced birthdays, and of course birthdays is not the topic of our discussion today, but as a side point, the origins of the birthday is pagan, like those people who worshipped in the time of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam statues and stones. That same belief is the same belief that underpins the birthday. And every aspect of the birthday is based upon paganism. One thing we have to understand and keep in my, our mind. Today, many of us will live until we are 70, we are 80, we are 90. Now this, a thousand years ago, was a strange thing. People would die early because of disease, because of famine. And their children earlier. A man could have ten children of which at least seven of them died. Many of them never reached the age of two or three or four, they died. So fertility, having children, having babies, which is something that's very important for the people of old. And why? In poor countries of the world, developing countries of the world, you don't need to have sophisticated machinery if you have lots of children. Those of you who are born overseas, you remember when you were young. When you were born overseas, everybody has a job to do. You either fetch the water, you go feed the animals, you go feed the goats, you go feed the chickens and cat, catch, they take the eggs. Everybody has a role to play. If you go back home to visit your family, maybe you, you watch your cousins, your nephews, or yourselves you go and do these jobs, am I right? Everybody has a role to play. Now. In a society that is based upon uh, agriculture, which many countries in the world were, if you have 20 children, mashallah, you have your own combine harvester, carbon combine harvester. You don't need a machine to go out there to catch the corn, send out the troops. Your 20 children will go out there and pick corn. Am I right? If you, if you, if you have a field of cotton, you send them out. They are the ones who pick the cotton. Yes? The mother and father have other jobs and duties to do. So it's important to have a large family. Because through a large family, you can maintain a farm. Now, this was something the people of old didn't have, that luxury. And it's something that they were obsessed with. They thought about night and day. And many of their rituals and their religious practices is around this. Maintaining life. Because as I told you, and as I said, that many people, many people died in those days. And now, where does Chris, well, Christmas fit into all of this? The ancient Romans used to have a number of gods they worshipped. If you went to school here, in this country, if they're doing their job of course, you will learn about the gods of the ancient Greeks, such as Nike. Do you know Nike? Who's Nike? Huh? Ah, it's a sportswear company. But also, Nike is a god of victory. Yes? You will learn about the gods of the ancient Greeks. You will learn about the gods of the Vikings. Why are the Vikings important?
Excellent, yes? Well, my good students, the Anglo, Angles and Saxons, the vast majority of people in this country are from the Angles and the Saxons. They are not indigenous to the British Isles. The Angles and Saxons come from the same region as the Vikings. The same region as the Vikings. And which is interesting, the history of the Vikings. How do we know about the history of the Vikings? They taught you. Where did they get that from? Could the Vikings write? No. Could they write? No. You weren't known to have an alphabet. Where's the alphabet of the Vikings? Did you see that in your school book? No. no. There is a film called The Thirteenth Warrior by Ibn Jubair. Does anybody know about The Thirteenth Warrior? According to fable that he was used to be uh, a minister of the, of the Caliph and he was kicked out because of things he did which were wrong. And he was sent with these Vikings. Yes? And his book is around still today. Still today, if you were in the Arab world, you could go to buy it. If you were in Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, you go to a bookshop, you can buy it. And he chronicalized, he put in his book about the customs, the fables, the traditions of the Vikings. Many of our knowledge about the Vikings come from him. And other people who went from the, especially from the Muslim world, meeting these people and chronicalize what they wrote. So my point, when you went to school, they taught you about the ancient Greeks. They taught you also about the Vikings, the worship of Thor and Odin and these gods. You also learn about the ancient Romans, yes or no? Yes? No? Yes. I don't know about the national curriculum today. Maybe they've <laughs> taken all of this out of the curriculum, but when I went to school, we learned these things. And so we find the ancient Romans have had a significant impact upon Western culture. For example, the days of the month. August is named after Augustus. The days of the week, we get them from Romans as well. And also, we get from the Romans, brothers and sisters, one particular day, according to Roman history, from the 17th to the 25th of December was a time known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a time of worship for the god Saturn. What is Saturn? Saturn is a, what did I say? It's not, I didn't say that, no. Obviously you're not listening. Saturn is a god according to the ancient Roman. Yes? This period from the 17th to the 25th corresponds to what is known as the winter solstice, which is now. At this time, they had this festival of Saturnalia. And in this period, the Roman courts were closed. Roman law suspended. And it was a time, surprise, surprise, of drinking, of lawlessness, and people filling out their desires. Does it ring a bell? So now, you're right, accurately describes Christmas, yes? So now, at this period of time of lawlessness, and drinking and having no law a number of things happened the Greek writer Lucian he describes at this time a number of things happening from amongst them was human sacrifice the ancient people would try to please their gods by sacrificing somebody yes often a young man so they would have a volcano which is raging. They believe the volcano was their god. Okay, what do we do? Grab one of the young men and sacrifice him to the volcano, yes? With a ritual, a ceremony that lasted minutes or hours. Then push him over, yes? To appease their god. So human sacrifice is something which is well known in the ancient world. 
well known, established practice. Some civilizations were very efficient in getting rid of their young men through human sacrifice. Yes? Sacrificing on a regular basis young people. So at this time, Lucian, he said, that they were human sacrifice. He also mentioned, look at this, brothers and sisters, the parallels. Intoxication. Do we find that today? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Going from house to house while singing. Do we find that today? Yes. yes. However, in the time of the ancient Romans, they would do this naked. You may argue even today, it might be wrong. Why do we all sit there naked? Because many people dress in clothing, but it's not like they're dressed. Also, there would be rape and other sexual license. People would do all kinds of illicit things. And amongst those things, he said, consume and human-shaped biscuits. And you find in some countries, in Germany, in English-speaking countries, making of human-shaped biscuits for consumption. What do we call these human-shaped biscuits today? Gingerbread. Gingerbread men, yes? Look at that, yeah? So in the 4th century, brothers and sisters, how many years after Jesus apparently died according to Christianity? 400 years after Jesus. Not one year. Not four days. Or four months. Or four years. Or four decades. Four centuries. After. They claim Jesus died and he didn't die. Christians imported Saturnalia festival. Into Christianity. And we'll talk about that later. They said, okay, we can't beat them. What do we do? Join them, Join them yes. The Christian church is fantastic at doing that. If you look at Christianity today, it is as almost, it has none of its Hebrew religious ceremonies in it. You can't even separate Christianity today from Western culture. Western culture and Christianity today are synonymous. Was Jesus a Christian? No. Was he a Christian? No. Why was he asking a question? No. 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 Not even in the terms of the Bible. You don't find Jesus saying Christian? No. That is a name that came after Isa Did Jesus speak English? Yes or no? no? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah? <laughs> it sounds mad. But many people believe when Jesus comes back, he's going to speak like the Queen. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's not happening. They believe that Jesus, you know, when we were young, when we were babies, you go to any black house, there are two things you are guaranteed to see in the front room. A bottle of rum and a picture of white Jesus on the wall. Two things. It's not a black house without those two things. One missing, you question the authenticity in terms of black culture. <laughs> guaranteed to find a bottle of Captain Morgan's rum. I don't even remember the name now. And I wasn't even a rum drinker. Captain Morgan's rum. And you look any black house, you see a picture of a man with white skin, blue eyes, blonde hair. You don't even find that today in the Middle East. If you go to Bethlehem, you'll be part of the majority, not the minority. You don't find it today. How are you going to find it for 2,000 years ago? But somebody sold them a lie. And I've told you many times. When I went to the Caribbean, my parents are from the Caribbean, I went to what they call a cathedral, a large church. When I go inside the church, Catholic churches, they have pictures, they have statues, everything. I'm looking inside the church now, on the wall they have the nativity, you know, the so-called crucifixion of Jesus. I see Jesus is black, Mary is black, Mary Magdalene is black, the disciples are black. The finger of God is black. 
And I think the same will be said for a church in Ethiopia or a church in Eritrea. Now I come here to England. Christian church at the end of my road. I enter into the church. Jesus is white. Mary is white. Mary Magdalene is white. The disciples, all of them are white. And the finger of God, the older Bila, is white. It led me to ask the question, will the real Jesus stand up? Which is the real Jesus? I'm looking at literature in China, the same confusion. And we all know Jesus never went to China. He never stepped foot in China. But they have a picture of Jesus looking Chinese. Mary's looking Chinese. The disciples looking Chinese. How is that? The reason, brothers and sisters, that we have this confusion, or lie is confusion, because many black people, when they close their eyes and they pray to God, they see this white man with blue eyes, blonde hair. Yes, a white man, blue eyes, blonde hair. And I ask you, brothers and sisters, where does this confusion come from? The confusion comes from, if you can't beat them, join, join them. By bringing in culture into religion, where religion is judged by culture, not culture being judged by religion. And so, they brought in, Christ they brought in the pagan masses, the masses of people. Remember something, brothers and sisters. The translation of the Bible into the English language is a new thing. For the overwhelming history of the Bible, it was in another language, Latin or Hebrew. How many people in this country speak Latin? Like five, seven people maybe? Yeah? On a, on a serious level, very few people speak Latin. And very few, even less people speak Hebrew. The only people who speak Hebrew probably in our country are Orthodox Jews. Because Reformed Jews, most of them speak Yiddish. And so, they want to bring the masses into Christianity and they realize if we tell them no Christmas, no Saturnalia, what will happen? What will they do? Anybody guess? Hmm? Exactly, they say, la that fan, I'm not becoming a Christian. That's their response. They say, no, nah, you can have that Christianity, we'll call it what we have, yes? Our religion is fun. So the Christian church absorbed Christmas, Saturnalia, like it absorbed Valentine's Day, like it absorbed Easter, like it absorbed Mother's Day, and all these so-called celebrations. Because if you can't beat them, join them. By bringing the people into the religion, what do you have? You have, brothers and sisters, the bringing of the masses into Christmas. Now, very interesting statement, and that is, most Christmas customs are in fact based on old pagan festivals, the Roman Saturnalia and the Scandinavian and German celebrations. And the Christians adopted these during the earliest period of the church history. What does that mean? that most of these so-called celebrations, that some Muslims, they use false analogy, they say, well, it's because of the people of the book, we can eat their meat, so we can also celebrate their celebration. It's a big problem, because we as Muslims should not celebrate, but educate. We should be educating people. You know, sometimes you see things that happen in your life, and you feel like, subhanAllah, you recognize the state of the Ummah. And it makes you feel so sad. What do I mean? I have worked in places where the mother who's a Jehovah Witness will say, I don't want none of my children having anything to do with Christmas. 
Start. They go to the head teacher. They're not asking for a concession. They're telling the head teacher, and I've heard it in my own two ears. If you keep my or put my children in any assembly at Christmas, I'm pulling them out. We're talking about November here. Pulling them out, you can see them back in January. And they don't care about being threatened about taking to court or the welfare officer. Bring them. That's what they say. And I have seen other Christian denominations take the same position. Here comes the despairing thing. What's the Muslim response? Just like now, brother, silence. Yes. If I was to say, if you saw me and I had like a Nero suit on and I was saying to you in the masjid, happy Diwali, happy Diwali, happy Diwali, what would your response be? <laughs> this guy be smoking crack or something. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> or maybe the, maybe brother, he doesn't take drugs, but maybe he was standing there, somebody was smoking, and he inhaled too much. <laughs> Am I right, brothers? Yes. <clears throat> or if you saw me one drummer, and I came in, and I had all different paint on me, different colors. And I said, Happy Holly! <laughs> what would your response be? The brother's high. <laughs> <laughs> Lost it. Hey, Lost it. Yeah, I'm high. All these responses are correct and accurate. Why? 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 Why would I? Why would I? Why would it be wrong for me to celebrate these celebrations? And and I'm Muslim and what? We're not allowed. Why? Because it's based on shirk. Am I right? Yes. And Christmas. Talk to me, brothers, talk to same me. Thing. It's the same thing, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes. yes. No? Yes. 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 It's the same thing. However, brothers and sisters, look at our response in the school. Like I said as I began, I remember a teacher said to me, Talib, what do you think? In the Nativity play, I make Fatima Mary and I have her brother, Muhammad, as the baby Jesus. What do you think of that? <laughs> I don't blame that teacher. That is her custom and tradition. Who do I blame? The parents. The parents? Where are the parents? Where are the parents? If your child gets a C grade, it's Armageddon. If your child gets a D grade, the apocalypse now. <laughs> yes? You are prepared to throw the child out the window and do a 15 year stretch for a D or an E grade. And he'll sit there on his bunk in prison and say, my son got an E. <laughs> the big grin on his face, happy that he took the law into his hand. And I'm not saying anyone should do this. But what about brothers and sisters when it comes to these celebrations? We have a right, and I keep saying this all the time, hoping that someone listens. The United Nations Declarations of Human Rights, which the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is a signatory to, allows you to publicly, that's in front of everybody, and privately, in the confines of your house, have your religion. Yes or no? Yes. If you think yes, raise your hand. Okay. The last time I counted, this wasn't a fascist state. Am I right? Raise your hands if I'm right. The last time I saw, we lived in a liberal democracy. Raise your hands if I'm right. If this is the case, you have every right to participate and not to participate. Am I right? Yes. If you read the newspapers and the magazines, they exercise a right to criticize Islam. They criticize Muslims. They criticize Islam. 
even though we go and exercise our right to criticize them. And when they criticize Islam, it is not Islam they're criticizing, it's Islam. The Islam of a particular individual, not what we believe, not in the Quran. I saw in the spectator the other day, look at the, mashallah, the logic of our academics and intellectuals. Yes? Our intellectuals. There was a swastika, the symbol of the Nazis. By the way, it's a symbol of Hinduism before the Nazis. That's a different story. They saw a swastika on a wall. Who sprayed the swastika? The Nazi symbol. Who sprayed it on the wall? Nazis. Nazis? No, obviously it was Muslims who did it. <laughs> Isn't it? We go around saying, see, higher, and we love Nazis and they love us. If I live next door to a Nazi, dream come true. If Islam spread in the United Kingdom, Nazis around the world will be jubilating. Am I right, brothers and sisters? Yeah. That is the logic. But that's what they said. So my point, brothers and sisters, what's our response? Why is it the nativity play, you have to find one or two Muslim children in the nativity? And I'm only exercising my, my right. I have a right, am I right? Yes. Or I don't have a right? You have a right. You have a right. Malcolm X, he said, you're either first class citizens or second class citizens. There's no such thing as called second class citizens. Rather, you have masters and slaves. If we have no right to criticize, we are slaves. No left, no right about it. And that's what we're exercising, our right to criticize. The same way other people are exercising their right to celebrate. But here is my point. That this custom and this tradition goes back to the worship of Saturn. It is a pagan festival with roots in paganism. That is, those people who worship statues and stones. The same people our Prophet wasallam was attacked and who tried to kill him and he came calling those people to Tawheed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this festival was incorporated into the Christian church was it based upon religious conviction? No if you read the Bible in the, the New Testament it tells you that Barnabas, who was a disciple of Jesus, had a disagreement with Paul. Paul is the person who, who basically, Christianity we know today is based upon his teaching. Who persecuted the Christian church. Then one day, he had a change of mind on the way to road to Damascus. He saw this figure like brass and it was fiery. It sounded like a shaitan to me when I read it. It sounded like Jesus. Sound like a shaitan. Then he changed his mind and became a follower of Jesus. Barnabas was upset with him. What does it say? Not from me. From the New Testament. I'm reading the New Testament. I'm like, subhanAllah. Because Paul allowed the breaking of the law. The law is, do you eat pork in the law? Did Jesus eat pork? No. You think Jesus will come into, imagine this. If Jesus went to many of the houses in this country on Christmas Day, he couldn't eat most of what they're eating. Think about that. Why couldn't he eat that turkey? It's not kosher. It's not halal. Isn't it? It's stunned and killed in a factory. Those who don't eat turkey, they eat gammon, which is pork, which is pig. Would Jesus take a, a slice of that with some roast potatoes and spots? Uh, uh, with special spouts? No. <clears throat> this is the thing we don't think about, brothers and sisters. We take things on lip service. Yes, we take things on lip service. So this is what Barnabas argued with Paul over. Paul allowed the, the Gentiles, Gentiles meaning the non-Jews, to not be circumcised. Look at that, brothers and sisters. They circumcised. He said you don't have to be circumcised against the law. 
They ate pig. They didn't eat pig against the law. Barnabas was rightly angry. These are the covenant. These are laws given to us by God. How can we break these laws? You can't take what you want and leave what you want. You have to follow the covenant. He understood that. Understood that Paul was making a, a religion very, uh, uh, very nice and palatable to the people of Rome. To incorporate them and their practices under the banner of Christianity. Even though it broke the law. And so, brothers and sisters, a number of things are of pagan origin. For example, from those customs that we associate with Christmas, which are pagan, is the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree. Pagans have long worshipped trees in the forest, bringing them into their homes. We have that practice today. I don't know in Bedford. Do you have trees where people hang things up, yes. wishing trees? Maybe at school, you went on a, a picnic or somewhere, came across a wishing tree, and everybody started hanging things up on the wishing tree, am I right? This is ancient paganism. Bringing trees into the house is a form of paganism. Now, brothers and sisters, what does the Bible have to say about this? Let's hear what the Bible says about this practice. It says, Hear ye the word of God. So hear you the word of God, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. So here, according to the Bible, God is speaking to who? The house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the ways of the heathen. Who are heathens? Pagans. Worship of statues and stones. And be not dismayed at the signs of the heavens. Don't be upset what you see in the heavens or happening. For the heathens are dismayed at them. Pagan and pagans, brothers and sisters, they tell the future, the past, or what is to happen by clouds by birds. They take these as omens. That's why Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he brought a chapter about the Sikhi time of Tawheed. Some people look in the clouds and say, okay, if the cloud goes right, we'll go. If it goes left, we'll go. This sounds crazy, am I right? But the former president of South Korea had somebody like that determining policy. <laughs> you have world leaders basing policy. Okay, do we go to war? We don't go to war. Let's watch the clouds. <laughs> so which, if this cloud comes first, we go to war. If this cloud doesn't, if this cloud comes first, we go to war. If this doesn't come first, we don't go to war. Cows are coming, coming, coming. Ah, oh, no war. <laughs> Yes? Like the ancient or or Romans who had the oracle. They use magic. They use these type of omens. And so, as the heathen, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Look at that. This is Jeremiah 10, not Talib. This is Jeremiah 10. And what's it saying to you clear? It's telling them, don't be like the pagans who go out into the forests, bring in the trees, put over it tinsels. Tinsels, you know tinsels, the silver stuff, the gold stuff, the balls, the, the fairy at the top. Look at that, brothers and sisters, the fairy. A secular people believing in fairies. Don't do this in your house because this is the practice of the pagans. And brothers and sisters, sometimes I'm amazed. We are told this is British values and that is British values. Who determines what it is or isn't British values? Who? Sorry? Who determines what is British values? The pe who are the people? The Since when did we... Are you part of the people not part of the people? <laughs> huh? That's a valid question, isn't it? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. The Labour Party, the Conservative Party, they come knocking at your door during election times. Am I right? Yes. 
So there must be some value in you. Are you the people or not the people? Since when do we put up for vote what is or isn't British value? Or is it the role of the government to decide the value? In a liberal democracy, liberal democracy, does the government have the right to say everybody follow a particular value? Or can some people dissent, say, no, I don't want to follow that. Is that possible or not possible? Talk to me, people. These are very important questions, isn't it? Your local MP needs to ask these questions. Do I, as a citizen of the United Kingdom, am I forced to follow every custom and tradition in this country? Or can I say no? He has to follow all the customs. No, you. Do you have to? No, no. Do you have a right to say no or no? Yes, you, yes, no. you do have the right to say no, but, but it's often printed as you have to follow it. But, <laughs> rather, that's fascism, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. How can you say it's a liberal democracy? If I have the right to be an atheist or humanist, but then if I want to become a Muslim, I don't have that right? And then the newspaper will ridicule me for becoming a Muslim? Isn't that fascism? You can't call that liberal democracy, is it? So, these are some of the things we need to think about. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, the Christmas tree was unknown in the United Kingdom until two centuries ago, in the 1800s. In around 1842, a newspaper advert for Christmas trees first brought to public attention about the tree. The tree was known only amongst who the royal family? As you know, the royal family that we have today, their origins are? German. German. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Didn't know. You know, yeah? Their origins are German. Queen Victoria, her husband was from where? German. Portsmouth? <laughs> Germany. Germany. Yes. And it is through him, Albert, and through his German relatives bringing the Christmas tree tradition to England, that it became popular. So when you say something is a value, this value is 200 years old. How did it become a value? Who has the right to say it is or isn't a value? Who? Who? I'm asking this question, not expecting anybody to answer. So we see the origin of the Christmas tree first was from paganism, pagans. Who brought in Christmas trees? Who worshipped trees? Trees are a symbol of fertility. But then as a tradition that everybody practiced, look at this brothers and sisters. You have all over the country, hotels and businesses, what do they have in their windows? Trees, am I right, yes? Yeah? Every year the tree comes out, look at this. The tree comes out with all the tinsel and the lights. Why do they do that? Stuff for a while too, really. Look at that. To bring in customers! You ask the manager, are you Christian? You know? Agnostic at best, atheist at worst. Am I right? Do you believe in God? You know, these are big questions for some people in this country. Yes? However, the manager will say to you, bring out the Christmas tree. Look how secularized we are. Coke have an advert all over this country. What does it say on the advert? Happy holiday. Happy holiday. SubhanAllah. Mm. Even yesterday I was on Facebook. What did good old Facebook say? Nah, no, this one, I showed my wife. This one was deep. <laughs> it was deep. Do you know what they said? Happy winter. <laughs> <laughs> Happy winter. Why are you having me happy winter? It's snowing, it's cold, it's miserable. Unless you're a pagan, the solstice is special for you. But happy winter, this is where we are today. The Christmas tree today has no connection with any religion, but this one, mammon, money. Yes? The manager don't care about religion, but he cares about customers, am I right? Yes? You know, a very famous saying we use, cream. What does cream stand for? Anybody? 
There must be one person knows what creams means. It's close to it. I told you guys a long time ago. Cream. Should I tell you? Cash rules everything around me. Cream. That's cream. Cash rules everything around me. That's cream. That's what they believe in. Cream. Ain't about Jesus. There may be one or two people who care about Jesus. But it's about bringing in customers. It's about what? Money. So my point. The other pagan custom is the mistletoe. So one of the customs that they have is at the office party and I see some embarrassed faces. They get a piece of mistletoe and place over your head. And you have to kiss him or her. Well, yeah, good billah. That's the reality today, isn't it? Yes? You have to kiss the person. Yes? You are forced by the mistletoe. But where did this come from? There are a number of sources for this. First of all, mistletoe was used by the Druids. And I've spoken about the Druids before. They're the ancient medicine men of the Celts, the original people of the British Islands. They would use this as a poison for their human sacrifice. So they poison you with it, put you in a state, and then sacrifice you. Also, we find with the Vikings a myth, a love myth, in which mistletoe featured very prominently in this love myth. Also, we have another pagan idea, is the offering of presents. In the time of the ancient Romans, the Caesar, the ruler, would force all of those people who disliked him and he disliked to bring him gifts. Look at that. If you don't like me and I say give me a gift, what am I doing? I'm rubbing it in your face, isn't it? Yes? But this also became a tradition in which not only people who disliked him, but also those people who liked him and others, they would give gifts. And this was incorporated into Christianity. Very much like why, what is the relationship between rabbits and Easter? Reproduction. Reproduction, yes? If you have two rabbits, within a month you'll have about 20, 30 rabbits. Fertility. Eggs also symbolize fertility. And that's what Easter is. It is a celebration of fertility. Based upon you can't beat them, then join them. And so. The origins of also Father Christmas. Who's Father Christmas? Satan. Sorry? Sorry, I said Satan. Okay. Remember you said it. I didn't say that, yeah? <laughs> Who's Father Christmas? Father Christmas, according to their belief, is a man, St. Nicholas. Very, very interesting. We'll talk about St. Nicholas in a minute. He is a man who, if the child has been good throughout the year, on the 20, the night of Christmas, he comes down the chimney, if you have a chimney, or through the window, if you have a window. And lo and behold, he'll put, if you have a sock there, he'll fill the sock up with goodies, and under the Christmas tree, he'll put all kinds of presents. Am I right? If you're naughty, then no. No presents for you, okay? However, brothers and sisters, St. Nicholas was a bishop who was born around 270 Christian era in Turkey. And this bishop, when he died, he had followers who made the worship of him a cult. And you may think it's strange, worship in a priest's house. When I was a Christian, there are people called saints, in Arabic, awliya, Allah. Yeah? Religious and pious people who are close to Allah. Am I right? So, one of them, for example, is St. Christopher, who is the saint of travelers, patron saint of travelers. So, you, you'd buy, every, every Catholic had a small little pendant, pendant with a picture, a so-called picture of St. Christopher on it. Yes? And so, before you travel, you say, St. Christopher, please help me to get to Birmingham safely. <laughs> yeah? A little, a little bossa there, a little quick kiss there. And when you got to Birmingham safely, you would say, 
Thank you, St. Christopher. Yes? Don't we see some parallels between this and some Muslims? When they want to travel, they go to the Wali. Oh, Wali, so and so, help me to get to Birmingham safely. I'm alright, Peter. Yes. And then when you get safely, you say, Oh, thank you, Peter, so and so. Am I right? Yes. Even though the Peer himself, if you were to go to his grave, and we're not saying anyone should do this, and dig him out with all his mystical powers, couldn't save himself. Could he save himself? No. Could he stop you? No. No. However, he's supposed to get you to a journey safely. All of this is shit. And so, he became a cult where people worshipped him and followed him and celebrated him. And his, the people who respect and loved him, they spread and it became incorporated into the Catholic Church as a saint, Saint Nicholas. However, in 1931, the Coca-Cola Corporation, they wanted to do a commercial about Christmas. So they contacted a Swedish artist and, this, and they asked him to recreate a Coke drinking Santa. They were a Santa drinking a bottle of Coke, yeah? So he decided to base his Santa on who? No, his friend, yes? He based the drawing of Santa on his friend. And since that day and time, everybody, when they depict Santa, is as if he was the friend of the Swedish artist. Very chubby man, white beard, sometimes glasses, sometimes not. He wears all red. By the way, the colors red and green are fertility colors. Again, pagan colors. You see him, he wears red. If you went to the supermarket these last couple of weeks, what do you see them wearing? The Santa hats, am I right? Yes? yes yeah. The Santa hats, yes? Why do they wear the Santa hats? <laughs> Why? Does it make you go in the shop? Do you see, ah, oh, Santa hat, you walk into the shop? <laughs> it's like advertising, you're right. Again, it goes back to what? Cream. Yeah? Goes back to cream. So now, this is the era of Santa. I look at Santa last year. A black man had the audacity to dress up like Santa and to give presents to children. What was the response? Does anybody remember? There was a big hoo-ha! Subhanallah. Black man can't play Santa. Yes? There was a big hoo-ha because ingrained in people's minds, St. Nicholas is this white man with a white beard, chubby, ho, 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 happy full of spirits and gives presents to kids. But there is a reality about Christmas, brothers and sisters. That reality is that it is estimated that 22 billion pounds would be spent on Christmas this year. Look at that. In Halloween, we said how much was it? 700 million? Billion. Around 700 million, we said. Christmas, 22 billion pounds sterling. Yes? 22 pounds. It is estimated during the Christmas period, same breeze makes, listen to this. And they have the audacity to say they have no money. Over the Christmas period, Sainz Breeze makes on average £5,000 a minute. Look at that. I used to work, I remember, I used to work for a particular supermarket when I first became Muslim. And I remember those days people would come in with two, three trolleys for Christmas. On average, just on food and drink. What's the most important of food or drink? drink? Drink. Yes? If you have turkey, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, potatoes with no alcohol, is that Christmas? No. It's not considered to be Christmas in our country. If you have no turkey, no sprouts, no spuds, but lots of wine, lots of honey, is that Christmas? Yeah. Hell yeah, that's Christmas! That's Christmas, yes? 
They'll go to work in January saying, ah, oh, I was so drunk, I just vomited everywhere and fell on the floor. And everybody had big smiles on their face, yeah. <laughs> yeah? I was so drunk, I fell on the bus. I fell off the bus, hit my head in the pavement, that's how I got this big gash here. Ooh, yeah. Am I right? This is the response people make for somebody being irresponsible. Yeah? A war wound because he or she was so drunk, they fell off the bus, hit their head in the pavement, had to be taken to hospital, and as they were cleaned by the nurse, they were saying, Happy Christmas. <laughs> and so, we find brothers and sisters, 22 billion is spent by UK households at Christmas, with the average spending of 796 pounds. Each house, on wow. average, 796, nearly 1, 1K. Now, the statistic is, and it's not my statistic, this is from British Turkey, that's where I got it from. The Turkey Federation, people responsible for Turkeys in this country, they said £159 is thought to go on food and drink. We all know that's more than £159 on food and drink. Maybe £100 on drink, another good £200 on liquor. Am I right? Yes. And we're talking about the legals now. We're not talking about the illegal things that people buy for Christmas as well, yes? Those aromatic, uh, arom aromatic cigarettes that they smoke, yes? On the balcony, after the Christmas turkey. This is a reality. And also, think about this, brothers and sisters. These kids today, they don't like our days. When I was young, if your uncle or auntie gave you some socks, what do you say? Thank you, Merry Christmas. What about today? They're throwing back in your face. No kids having no socks. No jumper with a rule of the red nosed reindeer on it. Hell no! Kids want, what do the kids want for Christmas now? Let's take it one by one. Brother said trainers. What trainers are they having? Nike, Jordans, Adidas. What's the starting price? 100 pounds, yeah? Upwards, yeah? Okay, trainers. What's the next thing they want? Mobile phones. I want to ask you, is any kid accepting anything lower than an iPhone X? No. <laughs> is that happening? Yeah. Who said yeah? <laughs> MashaAllah. Hassan's a good boy. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> They want the lowest to go is Samsung 7 in the Android range. And maybe you might get away with an iPhone 7. Maybe. Yes. Most kids, what do they want? iPhone X. The f it's not about calling people. It's about on January go to school. What do you think, fam? Yeah. <laughs> Am I right? Look at my Christmas present, you know iPhone, how much is the iPhone? A thousand, thousand pounds. Allahu Akbar. What other things they want, brothers? Xbox. 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 How much is the PlayStation? Three, four hundred quid, yeah? If you go to Amazon, you get the games and everything. What else do the kids want? How much is the laptop? Look at that. Imagine, brothers and sisters, if you have four children. Hey, it's not like my day. My day, right, here's a laptop and you all share it. Yeah! Am I right? Here's an Xbox for all of you. Yeah! Here's a computer for the family. Everyone can play it. Yeah! You tell your kids here's an Xbox for the whole family. What's the response? No. Now that, fam. <laughs> Am I, am I exaggerating? No. This is a reality, will you? Keeping it real. Kids don't want to hear that. Share uh, uh, Xbox. Or share PlayStation. Or share computer. <laughs> or share laptop. Hell no! They don't want to share no phone. Because you know what they're getting up to on those things. They don't want other people having access to the laptop. When they're downloading all the suspicious 
dodgy material on their hard disk. Am I right? Or on the X phone, so they're sharing the sharing the X phone. How's he gonna share the X phone? When in his contacts, his dodgy contacts, are dodgy people who mama and dad say don't talk to. And in her contacts, if he has a sister, are people she knows she shouldn't be talking to. How are you gonna share the phone? That's gonna be the beginning of your end. Am I right? So the kids I want to hear that, so imagine if you got four kids, you are potentially buying an Xbox 500, Nike Jordans 600, uh, iPhone X 1600, and what have I missed out? And, a, and a, a laptop around 2500 just on the kids. We haven't even touched the rum, the turkey, nothing like that. Just the kids present. And in, sorry? Okay, that's another thing, iPads, you're right. And remember, when you buy for Christmas, is it just your family? Ah, nice nieces, nephews. That's why we find one in six people are in debt. Why are they in debt? Because there's a massive demand. There's a massive demand. Imagine what we could do with 22 billion brothers and sisters. What could we do? Those people on the streets who are homeless, we could, we could build how many shelters for them and help them to sort their lives out and help them to get into employment. We could even make jobs with that 22 billion. Imagine what we could do with 22 billion. And I haven't even told you, brothers, how many hundreds of tons of turkey and Brussels sprouts are thrown in the bins on the 26th of December. Hundreds, not a ton, hundreds and thousands of tons of turkeys thrown out and Brussels sprouts. If we, we throw out enough Brussels sprouts to feed the Atlantic Ocean, if you were to dump in the Atlantic Ocean, the fish would get so fat they wouldn't be able to move. You just go by the, the fish and scoop this one. Take that one. That's how much we, we, we waste. Isn't that a crime, brothers and sisters, yes. in the moral sense? Yes. We have a world of starving people. A world where people don't even know that what's their next meal. And also, imagine the pressure on those people who live off food banks. You are poor, impoverished. And you have to buy all these gifts. Your kids are expecting iPhone. You can't even pay the telephone bill. You can't even pay the gas and electricity bill. But your kids are expecting these things. And this is the reality of Christmas, brothers and sisters. A Christmas where we will, we will consume at least 10 million turkeys. For every six people, one turkey. And the vast majority of those turkeys going in the bin. Being wasted. Don't believe me. On the 26th of December, walk up and down your road and look at the bins. It's amazing. If you, do you recycle here in Bedford? Yes. Yes? Just go on the 26th, Boxing Day, or on the 27th as well, Boxing Day is there drinking. Just go look at the recycle bins. Almost to the skies with bottles of alcohol. The bins are full of food. Waste. In a society where we are the 10th richest nation and how many millions of people are starving. Same with America. Over 20 million people in poverty. 20 million, can you imagine that? In poverty in the United States of America. With this being said, brothers and sisters, I know some of you look very tired. Can you hang on a bit more? You sure? Yeah? With that being said about Christmas, its origins and its customs, where do we stand? And I will try to make this as quick as possible. What will I do for you? Brothers and sisters, as I've alluded to, any celebration except for Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr is prohibited. On the authority of our mother Aisha, in a hadith that has been collected by Imam Muslim, 
She narrates that the Prophet said, Inna li kulli qawmin eidan wa hadha eiduna. Indeed, every people will have a celebration or a festival and this is our celebration. And we learn from this hadith, brothers and sisters, that we as Muslims have only two days of celebration and no third or fourth. Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr, as I mentioned before. Another thing we have to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that celebrating Christmas is resembling the polytheists, the mushrikun. In a hadith that's been narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, which is authentic, our beloved Prophet وسلم, he said, Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. Whoever resembles a people is like them. So you go and you have paint over you in Holly, you like the mushriks. You go there celebrating Diwali, you like the mushriks. The same thing with Christmas. You are like the mushriks in celebrating this celebration. Allah also told us in the Quran, Ta'awunu ala birri wa taqwa. And cooperate with each other on righteousness and piety. And do not cooperate upon sin and enmity. So when we work together, cooperate together, it's upon what? It's for righteousness. And we have been commanded not on sin and enmity. So something which is from the mushrikun, and we cooperate, this is cooperation, on sin and enmity. Given presence, given greetings, it's cooperation upon sin and enmity, brothers and sisters. Also, we have been warned in the Quran, Allah tells us in Surah Al-Nur, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amunu, la tattabi'u khutuwaat al-shaytan. Man yattabi' khutuwaat al-shaytan, fa innahu ya'mar bithahshaa wa munkar. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, do not follow the footsteps of shaytan. And whoever follows the footsteps of shaitan, then indeed it commands immorality and evil deeds. We don't follow the ways of the pagans, brothers and sisters. There's a very famous saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. SubhanAllah. Do you know what the Romans did? Some of the munkar and the evil the Romans did? Are we going to do that? No. Are we just simple clones and zombies? What society does we follow them? No. no. We are intellectual people with our own minds. And so we don't follow shaitan in his footsteps. For indeed, shaitan brings you to, to immorality. And look at the Christmas party, brothers and sisters. I don't need to tell you, all of us here will have our war stories from the Christmas party. Those of us who unfortunately were railroaded into Christmas parties. Sometimes, we feel social pressure. If I don't go to the party, I'm going to be the odd one out. And, you know, these parties are part of team building, bringing everyone together. So you say, all right, I'll go there and I'll just sit there. Come on, Muhammad. All right, just put on the hat. Oh, you put on the paper hat. You can't sit there with nothing to eat. Come on. It's, and they, look, at, look at Sheikh Khan's clever. They say, the turkey is halal. <laughs> we got it for you because we knew you're coming to the party. <laughs> Look at that. 365 days of the year, no halal. But today, the Christmas party, all of a sudden it's halal. So you're sitting there with your paper hat on. In front of you is your halal turkey with your Brussels sprouts and your potatoes, roast potatoes, and a fork in your hand. And I say, go and smile. And as you crack a smile, they take a picture of you. <laughs> then you're just sitting there thinking, what am I doing here? Then Sheila next to you says, come on. The Christmas cracker. <laughs> and you pull the cracker. Chotowat <laughs> shaitan. They have to pull the Christmas cracker. Vanessa from, uh, from purchases, she comes. Mistletoe over your head. <laughs> you're like, huh? Pop, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> yes? yes? Then they say, hey Muhammad, have a cup, have a cup of this. <laughs> You're stuff for a while. I don't drink alcohol, mate. I'm teetotal. It don't worry, it's 0.001% alcohol. <laughs> it's 
I think, mate. <laughs> so there, you start drinking this this pills, which you think was 0.001%, which in fact was the, he forgot to say, math wasn't his strong point. So the decimals go the other way around. <laughs> So it wasn't no point, no 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 one percent. It was one zero zero point no percent. So you're drinking this, and all of a sudden, mm, it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> and you start to become dizzy, yes. And they all say, yeah, let's start dancing. Do the can can. They all get to the line, start doing the can can. And who's at the back of the line? Good old Muhammad. Yes. <laughs> And then Muhammad goes home, you know, takes a, a cab home, goes straight to bed, everyone's sleeping because the party was late, his wife is sleeping, the kids are sleeping. He says, Astaghfirullah, what to do today? Goes to sleep, wakes up, when he walks in the office, everyone's, yeah, jeering him. And he's looking, why is everyone jeering him? All the guys are going, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And he says to his mate, Steve, what happened last night? You old devil, you! <laughs> huh? <laughs> you old devil! This is a reality! This is a reality! He doesn't even know what he did. Because he followed the khutuwat the shaitan. So he was drunk. For all he knows, he could have taken his clothes off and photocopied his body. <laughs> they put him on the photocopier, put the lid over, press the ring button. <laughs> Hasn't got a clue what happened to him. Why? Because he followed the khutuwah to shaitan. Brothers and sisters, also we have to be careful because the celebrations of the Mashriqeen are from bid'ah. And every bid'ah is astray and leads to hellfire. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he narrates of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, has been collected by Al-Imam Nasai, wa sharu al-amur muhdathatuha, wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a, wa kulla bid'atin dalala, wa kulla dalala tifinna. And every newly invented thing is an innovation, and every innovation is going astray, and every going astray is in the hellfire. So brothers and sisters, these, these newly invented matters that people take as religion are dalala, are going astray. And all of this going astray is where? Is in the hellfire. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Even if the people think it's something good, or the people think it's something productive, or the people think that it brings people closer, at the end of it, it is misguided. Also, we find that these celebrations of the mushrikeen, they are following the mushrikeen, complying to them. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al Ahzab, وَلَا تُطِّ الْكَافِرِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ And do not comply with the wishes of the mushrikeen and the kuffar. Don't comply. And I gave you a scenario how it works. Real life scenario that anybody could fall into. By complying with them, trying to make people happy at the expense of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dunya Versus deen. And I don't try to imagine that this is easy. It's not easy. Many people, when they come to this compromise, it is hard to juggle. But sometimes, brothers, we have to educate and not just celebrate. Also, as we have learned today, that these celebrations of the mushrikeen are acts of worship. And we have been prohibited in participating in acts of worship other than that which is found in the Kitab and the Sunnah. Allah says to us, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَلَا تُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا And worship Allah and do not worship other than Him in a thing. So we can't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for by the legislated way. And any other act of worship which is not legislated, we stay far away from it. Also, we learn that these type of celebrations, brothers and sisters, all they are about, as I pointed today, is about accumulation, getting more things. Allah says, Al-Hakumut Takathum. 
Competition in worldly increase diverts you. It's a distraction, diversion. Because when you talk about Christmas to young people, do you see tears in their eyes remembering what happened to Jesus alayhi salatu No. Do you see them when they talk about Christmas wanting to go back to their religion and practice their religion? No. Nah. In fact, those people who are Christians and they practice the religion don't even celebrate Christmas. Those who are holding firm to the fundamentals of their religion don't celebrate Christmas. But those people, the Ahlul Dunya, the people who like stuff, they're the ones who, who love Christmas. Why do you like Christmas? I get presents. Why do you like birthdays? I get presents. It's all about me. Getting, getting, getting. And so brothers and sisters, this brings our presentation to an end. And I have some important advice. First of all, brothers and sisters, it is important for us as parents with balance and moderation to educate our children about the reality of these festivals. The Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith that has been narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar where he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٍ أَنْ رَاعِيَهَتِهِ All of you are guardians, protectors and those responsible and are responsible for those under their protection. As a mother, as a father, as an older brother, older sister, you have some responsibility to the young ones. Many of us, who is the educator of our children? Sorry? No? Someone else, someone just said it. School. Not school, no? Sorry? The bubble box, yes? When our kids come to her from home, they're eating, watching the TV. They can spend up to five to six hours on the TV. Am I right? Yes. I dare you, double dare you, triple dare you, and myself. Take the television out of your house. What's going to happen? Revolution! Dictator, depose the dictator. Am I right? Yes? You'll come home and all the keys, the, the locks will be changed. <coughs> Why? It shows the impact media has on our lives. And so it's important for us in this day and age to educate our people. Much of the advice given to our children are from people who claim to be experts but haven't got a clue and what they know is purely academic. They did a PhD or a master's degree, they wrote a thesis or did some research but never lived a life with a road man, go to a professor to learn about the streets. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Yes? Sounds ridiculous. But that's our situation. We are going to academics and people, not just because of medical things, but for Tarbiya. We should learn Tarbiya from where? The Kitab and the Sunnah. Islam is not focused on learning skills alone, but cultivating the soul. So it's important. This tarbiyah is important. And it's difficult. No one's saying it's easy. Many of our children, no matter what you say to them, they are, sin they are sinful rebels. They are amazed at the life of those people out there. And only when they become mature, around 26, 27, if we're lucky, they start to realize, subhanAllah, all that what my mum and dad said was true, you know. But before that, it's a jihad, a struggle with our young people. Because our young people, they know it, though they haven't been anywhere. And they take advice from people, how should I put it in a nice way? People like themselves who have limited experience. Another thing, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to educate ourselves. Many of us, we came to England to to further ourselves economically and that's all it did. If you say to people go back home to Pakistan or go back home to Africa, they will say to you, what did I leave in Africa? What did I leave in Pakistan? Well, we left our minds in Africa and Pakistan, brothers and sisters. And you can see that today by the children. You can see that today by our children. 
If you have children, if you have relatives back home, look at their children and look at your children. Not in terms of academics, basic things like manners. Look at the manners. You can't tell your 15 year old to go get you a cup of water. You can't tell your 16 year old, today is your day to cook. What? Me? Louder! I've got things to do. And this is the problem. Our young people always got stuff to do, but you don't see the products of it. Okay, you've been busy. What have you, you got to show for it? Nothing. Then there's a brother you see him every time. Yeah, yeah, bro. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Okay. What have you done in the year of being busy? Show me something tangible. There's nothing to show. He has been busy doing nothing. <laughs> That's what he's been doing. He's busy doing nothing. Like the man who sits in his bedroom and he counts the air bubbles. <laughs> he's sitting there counting the oxygen bubbles in one room. <laughs> Is that productive? Like the man who said, I'm going to measure how much water there is in the oceans, but I'm going to use a five milliliter spoon. <laughs> so he goes down to the channel, goes to the beach, he starts five, 10, 50, and he does this for 20 years. How many milliliters will he count by the end of 15 years? Will he have drowned the channel of its water? This is like most of us. We are as productive as those individuals. So it's important, brothers and sisters, not just to come here and make money. Alhamdulillah, money is important. I'm not some kind of saint who says live by, by you know, begging. No, we have to make money. Money is important. However, money is not the priority. Am I right? Is money the priority? No. Because if I was to say, well, boy, I can make 2,000 by selling one of the brothers here, would I do it? No. Because we don't believe in making money any which way. We believe in the halal route. So same. Our children are our investment. At least if it goes wrong, you say, oh, hey, hands up, I tried. My limited knowledge, my limited resources, I tried my best. Alhamdulillah, Yom Muqiyamah, that's your excuse. But if you didn't try, what can you say to your Lord, Yom Muqiyamah? I was busy. Busy doing what? No matter how much money you make, it's never enough. What's the proof? Look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates could have made a million and say, that's it. Time to retire. Did he retire? Even today he's still working. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in America. Has he retired? He's like in his 70s. Still making money. No matter how much money you make, it's never enough. But our children are our investment in this life and the next life. And so, the Prophet told us in the hadith, as we can be collected by Imam al Tirmidhi, Rahimullah, Al Dala al Al Khair Kafa'ili. Whoever shows or leads others to good is like the one who does it.